So, um, shall I come to the next session? Um, we'll have Matthew Eshelman uh, from UNC Wilmington, um, who will be talking to us about what you think about Sartre's approach to the philosophy of mind is what you get. I'm not entirely sure <laughs> <laughs> what it will be, but I'm sure it's going to be great. So, um, so, yeah, thanks very much. Um, well, thanks to John and Beck for organizing and hosting this marvelous conference. It, it, it's really been extraordinary. The papers have been so good, I feel quite a bit of pressure. And I should add that there's not one single concrete example in my entire talk. <laughs> so, um, and I've handed out an outline, and I'm going to talk off an outline. I'm not going to read a paper. And I guess it's, I normally read papers because I get so anxious and I feel safer and more comfortable. So it's, magnifying my sense of anxiety by about a hundred. Um, I've been doing a lot of crossover work, you know, Sartre, analytic philosophy of mind, and Fiona mentioned how interdisciplinarity can sometimes get you into trouble when you talk about something in an interdisciplinary way, and um, it's hard to satisfy everybody. And typically when I give talks and continental audiences, uh, they think I'm overly analytic, and when I talk to analytic philosophers, they think I'm too continental. Not sure what that means. In any case, so what I want to talk about today is Sartre's philosophy of mind. While Sartre scholars generally agree on what Sartre rejects, uh, for example, substance dualism, Mui, Mervish, functionalism, Kruger, behaviorism, Barnes, and in general, all views that identify consciousness with or reduce it to matter, Catalano, scholars, SART scholars tend to remain silent or offer very few details when it comes time to explain the precise nature of SART's positive view. So my general aim is to ske sketch SART's positive view within a broad-minded topology of philosophy of mind, roughly, in analytic philosophy. So I want to begin by giving a handful of reasons why I think there's a lot of silence, why the bulk of analysis tends to be what Sartre doesn't hold. And then my aim will be to um, show that Sartre's considered view is consistent with non-reductive versions of predicate and property dualism, uh, but that the best fit is something like transcendental neo-hylomorphism. So I think there's uh, something peculiar, which is to say that Sartre's view, uh, the way that I read it, is closer to Aristotle than it is to Descartes. My strategy will be to sketch five different kinds of interpretations um, of primarily being a nothingness. And I'll show that each interpretation motivates a particular way of characterizing Sartre's positive view, uh, but that each plausibly gets some things right and they leave something to be desired. So I'll sketch a series of positions and try and say a little bit about what they might get right and what they leave to be desired and how that motivates the next reading. And ideally, by the time I get done, we'll have a sketch of a complete picture of Sartre's view, view, as it were. But before I begin, I want to talk a little bit about why I take it that there's a lot of so silence. And you know, the obvious explanations are things like the general obscurity of the text, inconsistencies, hyperbolic language, uh, winding arguments, and so on and so forth. I don't want to say much about that, but I think it's um, in many cases, frequently easier to say what Sartre rejects than, and why than to say what it is that he accepts. And I think one reason for this is that the positive views tend to cut odd orthogonal lines in between traditional positions. So between, for instance, realism and idealism. You can't say Sartre is one or the other, but it's hard to give a clear characterization of how he cuts between the two positions. I think particularly in the philosophy of mind, Sartre's use of not nothingness as uh, either identical to or somehow in relationship to consciousness 
motivates a series of interpretive conundrums. Um, if consciousness is nothingness um, and somehow counts, well, sorry, I, I think I'm not going to say, say much about that because I spent three years trying to work out this kind of pu- pu- puzzle. <laughs> um, you know, if, if one of the terms of the putative dualism doesn't exist, does that make Sartre a dualist? If you can count nothingness, then what work does it do in terms of annihilating uh, and imagining things? But if you count, if you count it, then why call it nothing? <laughs> Well, okay, so I'm not going to talk about these kind of puzzles. I think another explanation for silence in the case of explaining the positive view is that there's sometimes tacitly, and I think recently explicitly, Catherine in particular, um, in the, following the spirit of Heidegger, there's a focus on Sartre's dissolution of traditional um, philosophical problems as opposed to offering so- solutions. And I think that there's something right about that, and I'm going to say that it also leaves something to be desired. I think um, it's clear, for instance, in Adrian Mervish's work, Adrian argues that Sartre overcomes dualism, and he gives a very long list of views that Sartre rejects, but he never really ever gets around to saying what uh, position Sartre actually holds. And I think that to the extent that Sartre dissolves uh, certain aspects of traditional problems that revolve around mind-body dualism, that doesn't uh, mean that there's no work left over to do. And for me, primarily what I want to talk about today are unresolved interpretive uh, issues around Sartre's method. And the simplest way, I think, to put this is to say that I want to ask, how do you understand the relationship between Sartre's phenomenology and Sartre's ontology? Is it simply a question of description? Is Sartre simply describing different categories? Um, Or is there an argumentative dimension in Sartre's method that goes beyond mere description and tells us something about the structure of being or the structure of reality? Well, so I think maybe the best way to get clear on that kind of question about method will be simply to walk through what I take to be five different strategies or approaches to reading being and nothingness. And so the first one is the what I call the deflationary phenomenological reading. So in this case, the method is to emphasize Husserl and to see Sar is largely implementing something like Husserl's phenomenological reduction, which brackets all traditional questions about uh, you know, transcendent being. And so on this view, Sartre would deflate traditional ontological questions and directly read categorical claims non-inferentially off of phenomenological descriptions on the basis of free variation and eidetic ana- analysis. And I think that the result on this sort of strongly deflationary Husserlian reading it would be something like predicate dualism. You can give, uh, read essences, you know, the essence of consciousness is that it is in an intentional relationship that's always able to reflect upon itself. It doesn't apprehend itself in adumbrations in the way that it apprehends the perceptual world. And so you can come up with these eidetic differences between consciousness and its relationship to itself versus uh, claims about uh, the world as apprehended uh, while remaining silent on the ontological question. So I take it that predicate dualism is just merely, thank you, a uh, semantic thesis. And you could go so far as to say that the language of consciousness or the psychology of consciousness uses um, a special language and it's a special science. And, the, uh, you know, Sartre's existential psychoanalysis uh, can't be translated into the language of physics. But that uh, obviously seems too weak in the case of Sartre. It's difficult to escape the ubiquity of ontological claims that uh, 
pretty clearly go beyond mere predicate or concept talk in being a nothingness. So I think this motivates what I'll call the inflationary phenomenological reading, where I think one emphasizes the collapse of the appearance being distinction or the appearance reality distinction, and to shift perhaps uh, tacitly but non-inferentially from Husserl's essence talk to being or property claims. And here you would go through being a nothingness and highlight all of the instances where Sartre uses property or property. Um, so, for instance, Sartre discusses the property of annihilation, the properties of facticity and transcendence, the self as a property of being for itself but not of being in itself, and the body as an absolute property of being for itself. And so here the obvious results would be something like pro property dual dualism. And I might it just interject incidentally. Um, I had a sort of round table with Adrian Mur Murvish, and I think, and I was rereading re um, uh, Phyllis Morris's uh, book, um, Sartre's Theory of a Personhood, which is a mar marvelous book. But I think that, you know, in earlier generations, when people talk about du dualism, it was always substance dualism. And of course, to be a substance dualist for a long time has been a pretty negative thing. And it's only in the last you know, 20 or so years where views like predicate dualism and property dualism have gotten more attention. And so I think that that has uh, complicated how we think about Sartre. And that if you only, if, if when you think about dualism, you merely think of substance dualism, then you overlook the possibilities of predicate or pro property dualism. Well, with that said, um, the property dualist reading still has some pretty serious liabil liabilities. <laughs> I think there are some pretty obvious technical worries about properties or the metaphysics of properties. Um, Sartre denies that self-consciousness is any way object-like, um, and he claims that consciousness is uh, more like an event or a relationship. And so I think it would be fair to object and say that, you know, the property talk is, should, is just Sartre not being sufficiently clear and that he could talk instead of properties about relations and events. And then you might say, well, he's... Uh, a, instead of a property dualist, an event dualist, or a relation dualist, or a muriological myri dualist. And I think there's some theoretical territory that can be explored there. But I think the real problem with the property dualist reading, at least on the surface, is that Sartre's cardinal distinction between, uh, the, be, between being for itself, or the mode of being uh, for itself, and the mode of being in itself, doesn't actually cut the joints of reality in between minds and bodies. Right. Rather, and I think rather crudely, it carves reality between embodied self-consciousness on the one hand, or whole persons, and non-conscious bodies. So I think that once we recognize that, it motivates a, th a third kind of reading, and I call this reading the redistricting strategy, and the, which is tied to the invention of a novel language. And in the paper, there's a long sidebar here on he Heidegger. And so the strategy, uh, the redistricting strategy is to abandon the mind-body distinction as at least fundamental and redistrict our basic ontological categories and give them new names. And I think you see this most clearly in the case of Heidegger and being in time where Heidegger uh, you know, never talks about bodies and doesn't use the word consciousness in any po positive sense. Um, and so, in the case of Sartre, and there are commentators who would wish that Sartre never used the terms consciousness or perhaps even the body and just stuck with for itself and in itself. Um, so, I think that on the redistricting strategy, the results are something like ontological plur pluralism, and I think there's different ways of reading Sartre as an ontological pluralist, but I see it has uh, different modes or ways of uh, one kind of being and not two different kinds of being. So I don't see 
the for itself and the in itself as different kinds of being. I see them as two different ways or modes of one kind of being. And I think that's crucial, but I also think that there's a lot of textual ambiguity and um, it's uh, not uncontroversial. Well, but I think that the problem with the redistricting strategy reading is that it can seem to solve traditional problems by fiat. Say, oh, we'll, we'll just redistrict our basic categories and then there's no problem. And I think this is more serious in the case of Heidegger, especially if you look at the he analytic Heideggerians, Taylor Carman, um, et cetera. And uh, they admit, you know, that Heidegger doesn't really have anything to say about the mind body problem. And here you might think of Levinas's famous quip that, you know, does Dasein get hungry? Heidegger really never de deals with the question of embodiment at all. So I think it, the redistricting strategy uh, can seem amazing, but dissatisfying. It can seem like uh, tr solving traditional problems in some arbitrary way. So this motivates what I call the dissolution uh, therapy strategy. And this is also, in a way, uh, motivated by Heidegger. I think we see it very clearly in Wit Wittgenstein. And here the strategy is to show that a proper description of lived experience reveals that there's no problem to be solved. Um, and you might say, hence, the redistricting is on solid ground. Thus, uh, we dissolve a philosophical problem rather than give a solution and then the uh, dissolution strategy is almost inevitably tied to some kind of th therapy because we want to know what motivated uh, thinking there was an actual problem to begin with. And in the particular instance of the mind-body relationship, Sartre says, makes a pretty clear and I think compelling case that we confuse uh, first-person description with third-person description, that is to say philosophers try and connect their uh, conscious experience with the body of other people. Another way to put that is they mix their uh, first person experience with a kind of quasi third person analysis of themselves. Well, for me, the dissolution uh, therapy strategy clearly gets something right. I think that Sartre thinks that he dissolves at least the interaction dimension of the mind-body problem. But for me, it's purely negative it doesn't tell us yet what Sartre's positive view might be. So for, it strikes me as plausibly philosophically unsatisfying, what's the positive view? And the second problem, it seems to me, is that unlike Hart, Heidegger, Sartre never abandons consciousness and body talk. So even if you say, well, there's no interaction problem, you might ask, but what's the relationship? Or, and that strikes me as a question that's fair, fair game. So this leads to the uh, fifth interpretive strategy, and I'm going to call it the transcendental reading. And here you have a, a sort of combination. So you motivate the redistricting, the ontological redistricting. You no longer say that the fundamental distinctu distinction is between minds and bodies. You insist that the fundamental distinction is between uh, self-embodied, self-conscious creatures and non-conscious uh, bodies. But you show that phenomenological descriptions supply the evidentiary basis for situated transcendental arguments where the amplifying conclusions supply the ontological structures that necessarily make the truth of those descriptions po possible. And I think that once you catch on to the uh, transcendental style of argument and you go back and read Being a Nothingness, it comes out most clearly in the conclusion of the imaginary. But there's transcendental arguments all over the place. Excellent, thank you. I'm in a great shape. Um, so on the basis of a description of imagination, Sartre asks, what must consciousness be? in order that consciousness is able to imagine, and he gives the argument for freedom. Uh, Sartre does this uh, in the case of negation. He does it in the case of the experience of concrete uh, experiences of non-being. What must human reality be in order to have such 
for such experiences to be possible. He makes these arguments in the case of bad faith, after giving a description of bad faith, what must human reality be in order that bad faith is possible. And I take it that these are all transcendental uh, styles of argument. And we can, I can say more about what I think a transcendental argument is and what it has to accomplish. So, but I think that in the case of uh, Sartre's philosophy of mind, the result is, first of all, one, that my body is the permanent structure of my being and a permanent condition for the possibility of my consciousness as consciousness of the wor world. So Sartre gives uh, a transcendental style argument that you couldn't have conscious experience without embodiment. And Sartre then claims that, uh, and this is after result one under the transcendental reading, that being for itself must be holy body and it must be holy consciousness. It can't be united with a body. So, and then Sartre tells us that rather uh, consciousness exists its body. And what I want to say here is that the uh, relationship X exists Y cannot be uh, shouldn't be misunderstood as either X exists in Y, or X is joined to Y, or X is Y, or X is reducible to Y. And what my suggestion here, and I think this is in many ways following Heidegger, uh, is that the traditional semantics of the verb to be uh, fa fail in the case of embodied consciousness, that we cannot employ the is of identity or the is of uh, predication, and so Sartre has to reinterpret the existential use of the verb to be, and this gives us the very famous articulation, namely that the condition of the possibility for bad faith is that human reality uh, must be what it is not and must not be what it is. And we can talk about that if anybody cares to talk about it, but I take it that that is the ontological structure, not of consciousness, but of human reality taken as a whole. And so what I want to say is that that claim that uh, what it means to be a person for Sartre is to be wholly body and to be wholly conscious is much closer to hylomorphism than it is to any of the other views. It's not as if consciousness is located at one point or one part of the body. It's not as if it uh, emerges in one location, but it gives us a more holistic view of human beings as a totality, or as Sartre says, a detotalized totality. And so I think at the very end of the day, uh, to say that human reality is not what it is and is what it is not, gives us the uh, st structure uh, as opposed to uh, saying that the, you know, the soul is the form of the body, that that structure gives us an account for what makes embodied consciousness po possible. There you go. <laughs> 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 <laughs>